it ain't the left side or the right side, then it must be the fin side. Thank you, Solo D. Welcome to another episode of On the Fin Side here with Kat and Paul. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Spreaker, iTunes, YouTube, iHeartRadio, and on Spotify. And uh, follow our Twitter handles, too. I'm Brian Cat NFL. Paul is fanatic, P-H-I-N-A-T-I-C underscore P-I-C-K, fanatic underscore pick as well. So, Paul, we are into the week two of free agency free agency here where it's pretty quiet on the Dolphins front but we do have some news to pass along in this segment we'll we'll take a dive into a couple of things here we're about four and a half weeks away from the NFL draft too so I'm going to unleash again my top 13 Dolphins board I'm kind of hoping for a trade down at this point but we'll see how everything unfolds so first Paul inside our own division big news Rob Gronkowski at 30 years old, is going to retire from the New England Patriots. I wouldn't say it's a, it's a huge surprise. He has flirted with that idea over the last year. But a big, big name and a superstar leaving the division here. Completely. And for me, I think a lot of our longtime listeners know this. I've always been a fan of Gronk. He's a bit of a meathead off the field, but he's always been a clean player, a good player. And one of the very few we can say during this era is in, in arguably if the conversation for greatest of all time at his position. So football will miss Rob Gronkowski being a part of it. I agree. And Dolphins, to quote Chris Chassidy, who tweeted to me earlier, the Dolphins never found an answer for him and for covering him. I don't think the rest of the NFL did too, other than maybe Deion Jordan for about two games before he – join the coke bus there um so (laughs) (laughs) um other news paul too obviously week two of free agency passes by much much more quickly here the dolphins did sign jaguars offensive guard chris reed he played for new dolphins offensive line coach pat flaherty in jacksonville he was a swing man he started eight games over the last three years dressed for 25 of them only started one game last year, and I wa- actually watched some tape of his last two games. I I think he's really good on run blocking, like combo blocks, which makes a little bit of sense. And he can play center, he can play guard, he can play tackle. So the Dolphins have a lot of positions to fill. You can expect him to compete for a couple of them. But also in addition to that, I watched him a lot of times one-on-one in pass protection situations too. And it looked pretty Ted Larson like, I hate to say, but still it doesn't cost a lot of money to sign. He's going to come in. He's going to compete for a roster spot. Um, Anything that you make out of this signing? I like the signing. I mean, he's not a world beater, but you know what? The tape that I watched of him, he is a high motor, high effort player. So what he lacks in tools, he does tend to make up for with his effort and motor. And he's always hitting somebody till the whistle, uh, whether he's got to jump off one block, go to another, uh, you name it. I mean, I like this signing. I don't think he's anybody that's going to be a Pro Bowl player in the history of ever. But I'm I'm a little worried about the offensive line in general. So I think right now, the way it stands, he's got a shot to start, especially given his positional flexibility. Yeah, that's really scary. I mean, he has started – if they're kicking Jesse Davis out to right tackle – he has started eight NFL games, and that is by far the most experience, starting experience on the Dolphins roster right now. But I, I do expect, like you said, outside the of Dolphins... Tussle. Outside of Tussle. Let's... Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm, talk, I'm talking about a guard, though. Uh, oh, okay. So you got, t- got Tunzel left tackle. You got Jesse Davis at, at right tackle. You've got Dan Kilgore at center. But at the guard spot, you've got Isaac, Isaac Asiata. Uh, now you've got Chris Reed and inexplicably breaking our heart they have not re-signed or tendered jake brendel because i guess you know bringing back your starting off your best guard as bad as the guard position was for 700 grand is just too rich for their blood yeah um i could see it if if they had a complete offensive line that he just wasn't a, a future look for but uh 
it's looking more and more like this NFL draft as we as we've set off the air to each other. This NFL draft is going to be about trade downs and rebuilding the trenches unless Kyler Murray slides. Yeah, it's it's certainly starting to look that way. And just another little bone that I have to pick here with, and not just the Chris Reed signing, but Eric Rowe and Dwayne Allen. I mean, I it, it rubs me a little bit of the wrong way sometimes. These familiarity signings. I mean. Adam Gase did this. Joe Philbin did this. They brought in their the coaches they were familiar with, the veterans they were familiar with, and to an extent, every new coach is going to do that. But three signings now, three players who, frankly, I don't think are very good. But then again, they didn't cost a lot of money either, and they should make the roster. So we'll see what happens on that front. Uh, a re-signing I know you probably did like was Mike Hull. They did initially not extend – the restricted free agent contract to him, but they ended up coming back and re-signing him too. He, believe it or not, he's heading into his fifth year as a Miami Dolphin, so one of the longest tenure Dolphins now. Yeah, and he's he's a guy that I really like. I mean, he, again, another high motor, high effort player, but while he doesn't have the physical attributes that would blow anyone away, he always seems to be around the ball, whether it's on special teams, whether it's when he gets in there on defense, and he does his damn job, which – you know, I, I think Brian Flores can definitely find a fit for him on that defense with Patrick Graham uh, leading, leading the way for him. Yeah, and uh, let's take a look at switching gears to Robert Quinn. Uh, we talked about him last week where we expected him to be released. That did not happen, and now it may turn out to be a pretty good move because the Dolphins did eat that $1.1 million salary, or excuse me, that bonus that he had which makes it a little bit more appetizing for a team that trades for him. And it's quite possible the Dolphins will end up paying a little bit more of that if they pull off a trade. The Cowboys and the Saints are very interested. Last week he did spend time with uh, Dallas and Jerry Jones. And this week now he's going to spend some time with the New Orleans Saints. Those are two teams who expect to be a 10, 11, 12 win ball club. And pass rushers, they're pretty hard to find in the NFL. And Robert Quinn even though he was not a, a, everything the Dolphins expected, he could get to the quarterback last year. When all said and done, I mean, it's quite possible that if there is kind of a, a tug of war between the Saints and Cowboys, maybe the Dolphins end up getting a third round pick for Robert Quinn. If not, I, I would have to say definitely a fourth or a fifth. Yeah, no, I mean, I, anything fourth or better is a win in my book. I mean, even if it's conditional fourth, that could turn to a third based around performance and playing time because he's going to get his time if he goes to the Dallas Cowboys. He's going to get his time if he goes to the New Orleans Saints. So, I mean, you throw that conditional out there, unless he just falls apart again and just turns out to be a bad fit, you know, at worst you're getting a fourth-round pick. Maybe you can get a third out of the deal for next year. And, and Miami's really stacking up those future draft picks right now. Yeah, and one thing to keep in mind, too, is Dallas next year, it wouldn't really surprise me either, and I, I tweeted about this earlier, that maybe the Dolphins can package one of their extra fourth-round picks next year and Quinn and pay for some of his salary, and maybe they can jump up and get a second-rounder from the Cowboys. I mean, if you think about it, if Dallas expects to pick between 55 and 64, somewhere in that range, and they expect the Dolphins to not not be all that good next year, they may view that as, hey, we're only dropping 40 spots or so to get a, a player that we really think is going to make a major difference for us in Quinn. So we'll definitely keep you updated on that news as it continues to unfold. Also, the speaking of the NFL draft, Paul, the Dolphins did have dinner with Drew Locke, Missouri's quarterback. This is a player I've seen a whole heck of a lot of. You know, I wouldn't read too much into this at this point because – it's if you track like everyone the Dolphins met with last year, you'll see so many of these players they had the opportunity to pick. But what would you make of it if the Dolphins ended up coming away with Drew Lock at number thirteen? I'd hate it. Uh, I think you were spot on that the issues that he has are going to take years to correct, and I don't think he's going to get those years to have it corrected at least not on his initial team. I'd rather have Miami, and I think I put this out there. I'd rather have Miami double down at the position in the later rounds with, you know, guys like Will Greer, Tyree Jackson, Easton Stick, and, and take two out of those three maybe um, in the third through the fifth than, than I would have them wasted a first-round pick on Drew Locke because I just don't see 
him improving his accuracy in any way, shape, or form in a quick enough time period to be of any use to anyone with Miami. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I mean, I see the arm talent, no doubt about it. He's a good kid, um, no doubt about that. But I, I wouldn't see the point because if – you draft any of these quarterbacks. I mean, say say they have a, a chance to trade up for Murray. I don't think that'll happen. Or Dwayne Haskins falls, which I don't think will happen either. At least with those two guys, there I I don't think it's going to take a couple of years to figure out what they're made of. I think after a year or two that you're going to really understand what they're all about because they appear to be more finished products when you look at their production. Drew Locke's not that same way. He has great arm talent, but other than that. His feet are a mess. He basically threw four types of passes uh, at Mizzou last year, and I, I'm, I'm just not seeing it. But if the Dolphins had, I hate to bring it back to Juwan James, but if they had re-signed Juwan James and they said, okay, this guy has a really good arm and we're going to protect him and it's going to make it a lot more comfortable for him to to do this, that I would say – Okay, maybe I can understand that. But other other than that, it wouldn't make a lot of sense. And if you're just going to rip the page after a year or two anyway, I don't see the point in drafting him in the first place. So I'm definitely all out on Drew Locke. And I know we're both all out on Daniel Jones, too, which thankfully is losing a lot of steam. Yeah, no. Daniel Jones, Drew Locke, no. Uh, there's there's too much talent in the trenches at that point if you have to stand pat at number 13 to go after a wasted pick at quarterback or really a wasted pick at any other position. Yeah. And you mentioned a good, a couple of good names there, Paul, like Tyree Jackson and Easton stick and these guys that we're going to talk about in the upcoming weeks. That's really the point is that I, I see 10 or 11 quarterbacks in this draft. I would comfortably take in the first five rounds. And if you look at Luke Falk last year, I mean, I think at this time last year, nobody thought he would fall to the sixth round when the Titans took him late in the sixth round. And I think you're going to see one of these 10 or 11 quarterbacks fall down to Miami in that fifth round area. That's going to have some talent and might even be able to get on the field this year too. So, so we'll uh, continue to break down those quarterbacks as we continue to go along. Um, updating my top 13 board. And the reason for 13 is very simple. The Dolphins are picking 13th. A couple of changes here. I'll go right down the list. Some of these players, the Dolphins have a chance at, some they don't. Number one, quarterback Kyler Murray from Oklahoma still stays there. The rumors are still strong that he's going to go number one to Arizona. Number two, number three, and number four, we've got uh, Nick Bosa, Josh Allen, and Dwayne Haskins there. Bosa and Allen are supposed to go in the first five picks. It'd be a, it'd be a big surprise if they're not in the top three. We'll come back to Dwayne Haskins at number four. Number five, Quentin Williams at defensive tackle is expected to be that top five pick as well. But number four, Dwayne Haskins, the reason I have him there is, you know, he, he had a very good pro day, obviously had a really good year at Ohio State. I am hoping, actually, that the Dolphins are not going to be tempted to take him still at 13, just because I want that quarterback in the 2020 or 2021 draft when the talent level appears a lot stronger. Um, Haskins, the big thing about him is that he does not play all that well while he's under pressure, when he has a muddy pocket. And I don't think the Dolphins have the offensive line really to protect him. But, Paul, I do think if he falls to 13, the Dolphins may have to pull the trigger. Yeah, you pull the trigger and, and you have him sit behind Fitzpatrick if you have to, if you can't rebuild the trenches after him. Um rebuild your trenches a little bit more next off season as well. Keep an eye out on cut days, et cetera. We would start wheeling and dealing to try to build that offensive line for Haskins from there. But yeah, I mean, if Haskins is available then you're sitting there at 13, I think he's got too high of a ceiling to not pull the trigger. And, and one thing that you actually kind of led me to when you mentioned the 2021 draft classes for quarterbacks is the biggest flaw in like this tank for Tua plan we keep hearing rumblings in the background about is really, you know, what if Tua comes back and gets exposed for for flaws that we haven't even noticed yet? What if Tua comes back and gets an injury that doesn't allow him to come out and you've tanked and now you got the number one overall pick and there's nobody at the dance for you to go for? Um, you know, I mean, it's it's there's yeah. too much 
goofiness to it that's beyond your level of control. You, you play to win because winning is what brings players to your organization. And from there, you figure it out to go after the guy you want. Miami's building up the draft capital to go after somebody without tanking. So let's. I'd rather see them do that than than do this tank for anybody nonsense. Yeah, I I could go the rest of my life without hearing the word tank because it's not a thing. I I don't want to hear that word. I I don't want to even see a movie with a tank in it at this point. <laughs> Except so for the eighteen, they, they had a great flying tank scene. But beyond that, you, yeah, I I don't think I ever saw that movie. But that's a conversation for another day. Um, so, but. See the thing is, and, and what I what I post, post to Dolphins fans is, what's your definition of tanking? Because mine is intentional is structuring your team in a way where you're intentionally trying to lose games to get a high draft pick for the following year. That's my definition, and it's not a thing. If you if your idea of tanking is that they're not going to be active in free agency, that they're not going to scratch and claw to put together the the best twenty two man starting roster then fine but i i don't quite i don't qualify that as tanking no and and i agree it's, it's tanking is really if anybody's seen the movie major league which is, is a classic if you haven't seen it you need to i have it, seen that one what it, it, well you know it was a little before your time not all of us here are 40 and up now so you know it, it's uh but no, it's you know the owner puts together a team of rejects to to lose enough games to be able to relocate her team to a sunny destination, and you know while it's not going after a sunny destination, I mean putting together a team of rejects just to do the just just to get that draft pick to grab your quarterback. Guess what? You do that. You're grabbing your quarterback and sticking him on a team full of rejects that you have to rebuild the roster for. So that's a stupid decision anyway, too. So any way you look at it, tanking is stupid. It sure is, and it shouldn't become a subject of conversation. So we're trying to get that out of the way right now. But let's go back to this, uh, to my top 13 board here. So to recap, one, quarterback Kyler Murray, two, defensive end Nick Bosa, three, defensive end Josh Allen, four, quarterback Dwayne Haskins, five, Defensive tackle, Quentin Williams. Number six, I still have very strongly Ed Oliver. I think you can move him all around the defensive line. It impressed me that he showed up at 287 pounds. I think this guy would be a top three, top four pick in this draft if he hadn't been playing nose tackle for Houston last year. I think if you line him up wider, he's going to be a very good player and a star in the league. But after that six pick right there, that's where I draw the line and say, after that, I'm very, very open to trading down unless the compensation just is not there. But say the Dolphins do stick at number, number 13 there. Seventh on my board is going to be Brian Burns, defensive end from Florida State. I, I see, again, a lot of Jason Pierre-Paul in him. I see a lot of ability to, to not only protect, protect his body for kind of a thin guy, but also obviously bend around the edge too. Consistency is a problem with him, but it seems to be a problem with a lot of those pass rushers coming out um, in the NFL draft. Number eight is going to actually be Devin White from LSU. Now, I don't think linebacker is anywhere close to one of the top needs, but I see something special in this guy. He ran a 4-4-2 at, a, at, at the combine. He brings that Jamal Adams type type of leadership, former LSU player, that I see too, very emotional type of guy. And I think that if you could have Devin White, Raekwon McMillan, Jerome Baker as your linebacker core for the next, gosh, five, six, seven years, then that's going to be a special group. And you can cross that off the needs list really for the foreseeable future. Um, I think also having White and Baker as your two linebackers and nickel defense, you're going to be able to cover a lot of ground in the passing game. Number nine is going to be Jonah Williams from Alabama. I bumped this up after Juwan James left. He he played left tackle for Alabama here over the last three years, but did play right tackle as a freshman and does have that body type with the shorter arms at 6'4", 302 to stay inside and play the guard spot too. So just 
with his work ethic, his production, and the amount of positions he can play, I don't see any way he doesn't become a very good player at one position. Ten Montez Sweat, who is skyrocketing up boards after running the four four one at the uh, draft combine too. A little bit of my concern with him is that he makes his money strictly by pass rushing to the outside. I don't know if he has a lot of inside moves, and we. There's a pretty high bust rate with those types of players. We saw that with Deion Jordan. Um, we've we've seen that with a lot of other players like Everett Brown from Florida State years ago, kind of that outside only type of rusher. Vic Beasley struggled in the NFL other than one season for that same reason. Rashawn Gary has dropped on my board. I've watched a lot more tape on him. Not a dominant player, but he is six four two eighty and ran a sub four six forty time. Um but never really took control, and I think in this three-man, this uh, three-four-four-three hybrid defense here may struggle to find a spot a little bit more than these other guys. But still, a very, very good athlete. Number twelve, Cody Ford, guard tackle from Oklahoma. He uh, has he played right tackle from Oklahoma. I think this guy is strong as a rock. I think his athleticism is underrated, and also too, he played left guard for uh, seven games at Oklahoma. So, again, he does have that versatility. A, a big need at both of those spots, at right tackle and left guard for the Dolphins. Now, 13, Christian Wilkins from Clemson. This is what I call the Minka Fitzpatrick-type pick of the defensive tackle group. Great kid. He started, I, I think it was at Clemson, somewhere around, somewhere between 49 and 55 games. I don't have that offhand. Very, very productive player and somebody who continues to get better and better and better. So this board will change as we continue to go along here, Paul. Um, any observations or passing thoughts on anything we've talked about here? No, just looking at your top 13 board, I mean, obviously we've already talked about the quarterbacks. I, I am a fan of Cody Ford, but the two that really jump off the page to me, if they happen to fall, are really Ed Oliver or Devin White. I just think what they could bring to that defense – and while you're in this rebuilding mode, if a great player that could be a fantastic fit does happen to fall to you and could be dominant and you can scheme around him, you have to pull the trigger on that guy, especially during a rebuild like what Miami's going through right now. You take the special player if they're there and do what you can with the rest. And we're going to talk about a lot of these draft picks here over the next four to four and a half weeks. You are listening to On the Fin Side. That will do it for our segment of week two of the Wake Two breakdown here in free agency and my updated top 13 board. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Spreaker, iTunes, YouTube, iHeartRadio, and on Spotify. Also, check out our merch store, onthefinside.threadless.com. And if it's not on the right side and it's not on the left side, it is on the fin side. Solo D, take us home. It ain't the left side or the right side. And it must be the fin side. side. It ain't the left side, left side or the right, right side. side. And it must be the fin side. Look, listen, Dolphins fans across the land all tuning in to see what Brian Catton.